Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Surrounds with Dazzle Physics. In today's session, we're going to be talking about pendulums and derivation of t is equal to 2 pi root L over g, where capital T stands for the time period, L stands for the length of the pendulum, and G stands for the gravitational field strength. And before we get started, guys, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and turn on the notifications for more cool physics videos, guys. Alright, so let's get straight into it with the following. Previously, we talked about pendulums exhibiting simple harmonic motion, guys. So pendulums exhibit simple harmonic motion. And what does it mean to exhibit simple harmonic motion? We know that for an object to exhibit simple harmonic motion, the acceleration is proportional to the displacement and in the opposite direction. Given by the equation a is equal to minus omega squared x, where a is the acceleration, x is going to be the displacement. So here is our pendulum right now, I've drawn it out over here, and here, guys, over here, we're going to label this the length of the pendulum. Obviously, that's the length of the pendulum here. We're going to label a couple of other things for, on this diagram here. So first of all, let's label the weight. So the weight is acting vertically downwards, mg. And from here, we're going to find components of the weight. So let's find, let's drop this over here, and let's drop this back down here. Right, there's obviously going to be a component of the weight pulling it back to the equilibrium position. That's going to be this component over here. And we need to obviously analyze the rest of the pendulum. So we're just gonna make another dashed line over here, and we're gonna label this the angle of theta. Theta is that angle between the equilibrium position and the angle which the pendulum is being suspended at. Therefore, this theta over here is the same as this theta over here. They're both the same theta. Therefore, the component of the weight Bringing it back down to the equilibrium position is going to be, obviously, a little bit of a trig. So this will be mg sine of the angle theta. mg sine of the angle theta pulling it back down here. Easy stuff. That's going to be the restoring force, guys. mg sine of the angle theta. So we'll put that down over here. So the force restoring it, F restoring, I'll just change the color of the pen. F restoring will be equal to m g sine of the angle theta, m g sine of the angle theta here. Right, we're going to have to put a minus sign in front of it. The reason why is because it's always back to the equilibrium position. So it'll be minus m g sine theta. We know there will be a resultant force acting upon this um, pendulum over here. So therefore, the force resultant will be equal to, as usual, due to Newton's second law, it'll be equal to m a over here. The restoring force is the same as the resultant force here, so therefore we can say that F resultant will be equal to F restoring. From here we know that the resultant force, therefore MA will be equal to minus MG sine of the angle theta over here. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to label something else over here. We're going to label the displacement from the equilibrium position. So this is going to be x over here, x over here. Therefore, we can do something quite nice. Well, we know that if we're looking at sine, so look at that triangle over here. We know that sine of the angle theta is obviously opposite over hypotenuse. So the opposite will be x divided by hypotenuse L over here. There we go. So now, guys, we can replace it into our formula. It becomes MA is equal to minus MG. And look, sine theta is X over L. So therefore, X over L over here. Canceling out the M from both sides. So cancel, cancel over here. So therefore, we end up with A is equal to minus G over L X over here. So A is equal to minus G over L X. Easy stuff. Right, now we know this object will be exhibiting simple harmonic motion. So you already know that A is equal to minus omega squared X. That is true for this object. So therefore, if we put it over here, A is equal to minus omega squared X. And now look what we can do. We can actually find out the value of omega because look, we have A on this side over here. There we go. X on this side over here. And obviously, you can clearly see that minus omega squared is equal to minus g over L. So guys, we have omega squared now equal to g over L. Fantastic stuff. Obviously, the minus minus cancels out. 
Therefore, we can say that omega will be equal to the square root of g over l, guys. Omega is equal to the square root of g over l. So that is for the pendulums, guys. And obviously, um, make sure that you understand all of what all the different variables stand for. L is the length of the pendulum. G is the gravitational field strength. Hopefully, you still remember that from GCSE. But now we have a value for omega for the pendulum now. Now, we're going to actually get a value of the time period into this equation here. So how are we going to do that? Let's scroll down for a bit more space. Well, we know that omega is equal to root g divided by l. Omega is equal to the angular velocity, the angular velocity, which is equal to, obviously, the rate of change of angle. So it's going to be theta divided by t, total angle swept divided by total time, or for one rotation, guys, it's going to be 2 pi divided by the time period t. 2 pi divided by the time period t over here. Or if you want, 2 pi f, because you know that f is equal to 1 over t as well. So we have that as well. So let's try and get t into here. So let's use this bit over here. We have omega here. We have 2 pi over t over here. So therefore, it becomes 2 pi divided by t is equal to root g divided by l over here. Therefore, we're going to square the whole thing and rearrange it. So therefore, it becomes t will be equal to 2 pi. Obviously, we're going to be moving the t up, l up, the root g down, 2 pi root l over g. And as you can see, guys, we have proved the equation for the time period for a pendulum is equal to 2 pi root l divided by g, guys, 2 pi root l over g. This is really interesting, the reason why is because, first of all, you can see that the time period is independent of the mass. It's only dependent upon the length and the gravitational field strength. So it's only dependent upon the length and gravitational field strength and independent of the mass, guys. Because look, there's no m in this equation over here. Easy stuff. Okay, so the next question is going to be the following. So here we go, guys. A practical investigation using t is equal to 2 pi root l over g to find the value of g. We're going to look at the graphical method now. So obviously, all the practicals in able physics, you'll need to be able to plot a graph and work from there. As you can see on the left-hand side, I've drawn the pendulum in its oscillation. So look, one complete oscillation, it's there, swings out, middle, back, then back to the middle again. That's one complete oscillation. So this would be when time t is equal to zero. This one would be time t is equal to the time period t over here. So that's one complete oscillation over here. Now from here, guys, what can we change and what can we actually measure? So look at that equation. We can't really change gravity, obviously, unless you're going to change planet, but we can change the length and we can look at the time period here. So in a simple practical, guys, let's make the following grid. So we're going to change, obviously, the length of the pendulum. OK, we're going to measure the time period. And obviously, we don't measure the time period just once, like one oscillation. You measure for a multiple. So let's measure for 10t. And then, obviously, to find t, you simply divide the value you worked out, divided by 10, wherever you've actually got there. So let's increase the length of the pendulum. Let's go, let's go 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 40, blah, blah, blah. And you measure the time period. Notice when you take readings, you take it from when it's going past the center of the equilibrium position, outwards, back, and back to the center. Yes, that's when you always take your readings, guys. So the time period is taken from one complete oscillation here. So you obviously times the 10, divide by 10, you get your value of the time period over here. Now, we have changed the length, we've measured the time period. What are we going to plot on our graph for the graphical method? Well, write it down. So we know that t is equal to 2 pi root l divided by g. Now, let's square the whole thing. We get t squared is equal to 4 pi squared and l over g pops out over here. Now, guys, look, I'm just going to shift the underneath the g bit. It will become t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g times by l over here. Now, from here, guys, we're going to relate it to the equation of a straight line. So therefore, we're going to put down y is equal to mx plus c. This will help us identify what to plot on which axis. So as you can see from here on my y axis, if I plot t squared, x-axis, I plot the length, and obviously I'm changing the length, I'm plotting t squared on the y-axis, there we go, look, it matches up, we can clearly see that the gradient of this line, given by the equation, will be equal to 4 pi squared over g, so over here, we're over here right now, so let's say we plot the straight line graph, we end up with 
dy by dx, which is the gradient of the line, is equal to 4 pi squared divided by g over here. Fantastic. So therefore, to work out g, you know that g will be equal to 4 pi squared divided by the gradient of your line, guys. 4 pi squared divided by the gradient of your line. Easy stuff, guys. Therefore, you can verify g on Earth. So if you do this practical in school, obviously you'll get g to be obviously around 9.8, guys. Obviously, because it works. Some of you might say then, okay, so why did you square it? We don't have to square it. You don't have to square it if you don't want to. An alternative graph you can plot is the following. So an alternative graph that you can plot, well, have a look, guys. You don't have to square any of it. You can just simply do this. We know that t is equal to 2 pi uh, root l over g. I'm just going to split out that root bit. It becomes t is equal to 2 pi. And then it's going to be root l. I'm going to put the root g down here. Now I'm going to relate to the equation of a straight line. We're going to go for y is equal to mx plus c. From here, we can now relate it and decide what to plot on what axis. On the y-axis, I plot t. There we go. X-axis, I'm going to plot root l. So look, obviously, I need to calculate root l now. So root l goes on here. And as you can see, we'll obtain another straight line graph. And look, we know that the gradient of this line, yes, because m is going to be the gradient, will be equal to 2 pi root g. So there we go. There, there, there we go. Gradient is equal to delta y over delta x is equal to 2 pi over root g over here. Then rearranging this formula to work out the value of g, we know that root of g is equal to 2 pi divided by your gradient. Therefore, we can say that g is equal to, obviously get rid of the root, square the whole thing, 4 pi squared divided by your gradient squared, the gradient value squared over here. Easy stuff. And that's it for another session of Sarazzle Dazzle Physics. Let's have a quick recap right from the top so we can go through it all again. So right from the top, we said pendulums and the derivation of t is equal to 2 pi root L over g. Scrolling down, we said that pendulums exhibit simple harmonic motion over here. As you can see, we know that for simple harmonic motion to be valid, acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x, where acceleration is proportional to displacement in the opposite direction. We then looked at this diagram over here, we resolved it, we found the restoring force and equated that to the resultant force. We did a bit of algebra, used the sine theta is x over l, and we related it to the equation of SHM. We found omega is equal to root g divided by l, guys, root g divided by l. Then scrolling down, we then said that, well, from there, we can then incorporate the time period t. We know that omega is 2 pi divided by t, therefore t is equal to 2 pi times by root l over g. So t is equal to 2 pi root l over g. Wonderful stuff. Then we looked at a practical investigation using the time period to find the value of g. So look guys, we have the equation t is equal to 2 pi root l over g. Notice then, if we plot t squared against l, the gradient of the line will be equal to 4 pi squared over g, and therefore g will be equal to 4 pi squared divided by your gradient. And obviously you relate it to the equation of a straight line, y is equal to mx plus c. Scrolling down, we can also plot an alternative graph, which is obviously going to be t against root l. And look, it's a bit different now. You don't have to square it. We know that the gradient of this line will be equal to 2 pi divided by root g. Or if you don't want that, g will be equal to 4 pi squared divided by your gradient squared, guys. There we go. And that's it for another session of Surrounds with Dazzle Physics. Make sure you like and subscribe to keep my channel going. Follow for the physics vibe. Ciao, ciao, and goodbye.